My main intention with this channel is to try and pay tribute to the movies that many of us hold dear, while trying to understand what motivates this nostalgia. Why do we love the movies that we love? How do these movies shape us? Do these movies deserve more recognition? Or are we stubbornly coveting movies that didn't actually stand the test of time because we ourselves are afraid of growing old and fading into obscurity and irrelevance? Whoa. <laughs> Cinematters to me is about getting to the heart of these questions. Why does it cinematter to me? Essentially, I'm trying to deconstruct the concept and function of nostalgia. The movie Labyrinth was made in 1986. It's a directorial debut of Jim Henson and is truly beloved by many of my peers. But unlike most of the movies I'll discuss on this channel, I didn't watch it until I was an adult, around 27. This means I didn't have the rose-colored lenses of nostalgia. And rather than being transported back to the first time I ever watched it and revisiting that childhood sense of wonder, I watched the movie with more of a critical eye. That's not to say I was trying to criticize or tear the movie apart. Quite the contrary. I was definitely inebriated, like definitely, and fully open to enjoying the hell out of it. But I was still watching it as an adult, an adult that can't help but actively analyze the technical and thematic elements of a movie. Yeah, the black and white stuff is all derived from a forward running sequence. So if you take these individual black and white scenes, they run forwards. If you stick them together, they actually overlap in the same way that the backwards scenes overlap. Immersion naturally comes easier for a child. But for better or worse, adults love to overthink. My overthinking led me to believe there was a second story being told underneath the whimsical fantasy narrative. A much darker conceit. A metaphorical journey being shaped by the labyrinth itself. So, what's the symbology there? What was interesting is that the metaphors were blatantly intended, in my opinion. When the movie finished, I turned to the girl I was watching with and asked a couple questions about specific symbolism. The symbolism? What is the symbolism? And she looked at me like I was crazy. She didn't really see any metaphors in the story. She just saw the story. She just enjoyed the experience. Now this friend is a very astute person, so the whole thing really confused me. Was I overanalyzing a children's fantasy movie? Or had the creators of the film really create a subliminal plotline that was meant to deliver a deeper hidden moral? A moral that my friend may not have been aware of as an adult, simply because she was still nostalgically viewing the movie as a child. Ball has just left me with more questions and answers. And because I can't just let people enjoy things and I want attention for thinking good. And want to learn to do other stuff good too. I decided to do some research and look into this theory. I found that there was in fact a slim number of articles or blogs online that also proposed this film as an allegory. However, there wasn't really any succinct video essays exploring these theories. So I set about trying to make my own. What I discovered was quite interesting and also somewhat dark. Interesting production details. Fascinating moments of artistry mimicking real life, and even disturbing allegations surrounding the stars themselves. And ah, oh God, I'm already three minutes into this essay and I basically haven't even started it. Hey everybody, today we're going to talk about the six signs of high-functioning depression. So, without further ado, this is my theory about how 1986's The Labyrinth is one long extended metaphor about a young girl on the edge of adulthood trying to make sense of the transition between youth and maturity. A tale of innocence versus experience. On the surface, this movie is about a young girl named Sarah, played by Jennifer Connelly, who dreams of being an actress, monologuing in the park in a Victorian dress like your standard insane drama kid. Waving my hands a lot, specific point of view on things. Sarah is 16 in the movie and is in the awkward transitory time between childhood and adulthood, wherein she dreams of being treated like an adult, but she still enjoys acting like a child. And in the beginning of the movie, she kind of comes across as the worst. Someone has been in my room again. I hate that. I hate it! I hate you. I hate you! Someone save me. Someone take me away from this awful place. Drama kids kind of are the worst, so. Carnival! Paris, France. <laughs> Vive la France. <laughs> her father and his stepmother task her with babysitting her little brother, and she essentially takes out her angst on him. Referring to the place she was just monologuing, she tells her little baby brother that a goblin king has bestowed her the power to send him to the goblin kingdom, wherein he would be turned into a goblin. 
She says the magic words to send her brother away. Goblin King! Goblin King! Wherever you may be, take this child of mine far away from me! And David Bowie appears as Jareth, the Goblin King. Jareth's whole thing is that he's creepily obsessed with Sarah. He wants to keep her baby brother Toby and turn him into a goblin. He's got a giant bulge in his pants, and he likes to juggle crystal balls. <laughs> Fun fact. Turns out it's not David Bowie who's juggling the balls this whole time. It's actually this poor bastard who effectively had to give a reverse reach around for literally hours at a time with a face full of booty cheeks. <laughs> he was not enjoying himself. <laughs> Jared takes Toby away, transports Sarah to a goblin kingdom, and says if she wants to get her brother back, she has to travel through the labyrinth, past the goblin kingdom, and into this castle within 13 hours. What follows is the chronicling of Sarah's journey through the labyrinth, wherein she's faced with constant puzzles, riddles, setbacks, and perils, befriending unlikely creatures throughout to help her in their quest. Jareth is constantly berating her and those who help her as he manipulates the rules and sets various traps and schemes to halt her progress, while simultaneously growing frustrated, both by her progress and what seems like his own frustrations and his vague but palpable affections towards her. As an adult watching his interactions with Sarah, his obsession towards her is pretty uncomfortable, but that's something we'll get back to later. I'm definitely speedrunning this synopsis. But essentially, Sarah and the friends she makes along the way make it to Jared's castle, and Sarah is able to overcome Jared to get her baby brother back, and is transported back to her home. Though I'm understating the plot here, I don't want to understate just how magnificent the set pieces and puppetry are in this movie. It definitely has Jim Henson's mastery on full display, and it's undeniably easy to understand how immersive this fantastical world would be for a young viewer. Henson was hot off the wheels of his work on The Dark Crystal, which ironically, he admitted became a lot darker than he expected. And he wanted to bring humans back into the mix. Hansen presented this idea to his concept designer, Brian Froud, 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 who drew up this initial picture. I sat down and started to paint this picture. About six months later, my son Toby was conceived. And the strange thing was that he turned out to look just like the baby that I'd drawn. And he was the baby that we used in the film. In the original script, Toby was named Freddie. But since the boy's name was actually Toby, and he responded much better to this while filming his actions, they changed the character's name to Toby. In this sense, Toby is the only person playing himself. Well, except maybe David Bowie. This was essentially the inception of the movie, with an inciting incident based around the traditional folklore of goblins stealing babies. Terry Jones, a writer for Monty Python, took this loose skeleton of a concept and hashed it out. He added Sarah as a main character, and then Henson insisted on including a famous musician as Jareth. Michael Jackson and Mick Jagger were considered, but Henson wanted to go with Sting. Oh my God! What? It's Sting! What? However, his kids convinced him to go with Bowie. Many, many disagreements, rewrites, and around 25 redrafts later, we got the Labyrinth script as it is known today. At its core, Labyrinth is a story about a teenager trying to come to grips with the transition between childhood and adulthood. But rather than employ heavy-handed methods to didactically explain the themes of the movie... Well, here's the thing, Bruce. I'm great at controlling my anger. Mm. I do it all the time. When I'm catcalled in the street, when incompetent men explain my own area of expertise to me, I do it pretty much every day because if I don't I will get called emotional or difficult or might just literally get murdered. Henson wishes show rather than tell, all the while creating a fun experience for the viewer. In this sense, it's understandable that the younger viewers wouldn't necessarily pick up on the metaphorical significance of certain characters or situations, but like many classic magical movies, the positive messages are internalized by the viewer as they travel through the experiences with the character, witnessing firsthand the results of choices made along the way, and hopefully using these examples in their own lives. Alright, we finally made it to what I actually wanted this essay to be about. 
God damn it, I know myself. Do you think all this could be because you hate yourself? Yes. It's kind of ironic I'm making a video essay about a magical movie that weaves its tones and themes into itself effortlessly by making one of the most goddamn boring video essays I've ever heard in my fucking life. God damn it. There's a couple things we gotta get out of the way up front. First, this entire journey is in Sarah's imagination. It never happened. It never happened. It never happened. It's a made up tale. It's a total fabrication. I don't wanna piss off too many nostalgia lovers here. It's still real to me, damn it! <laughs> I mean, thank you. But there's a few things that evidence this. First off, the place she's reciting at the beginning of the movie is about the Goblin King stealing children, and is literally what inspires her to create the entire plot of this movie. Secondly, many of the key characters that she encounters in the movie are based on toys and objects you see around her room. Here's a quick list. This stuffed animal is Sir Didymus. This doll is Ludo. This doll is one of the fire gang. This bookend is Hoggle. The dress on the doll is the one she wears in the questionably creepy ballroom scene. This maze game is the hedge portion of the labyrinth. This painting is the cleaner machine. There's an M.C. Escher painting, which is a set piece near the end of the movie. And there is even a newspaper clipping of a picture of her famous actress mother with Bowie. This last detail may seem fairly innocuous in light of all the other objects, but I'd argue that this is a most important element to the story when trying to make sense of the metaphorical conceit being woven into the narrative. It is explained in the novelization that Sarah's mother was a famous actress, and while filming with an esteemed co-star, David Bowie, she had an affair with the man and left Sarah's father. This is why in the beginning of the movie, the motherly figure in her life is referred to as her stepmother. Once upon a time, there was a beautiful young girl whose stepmother always made her stay home with the baby. In light of this, it can be argued that the trauma surrounding this sense of betrayal and loss is the true inciting incident of her journey, as it leads Sarah down a path of escapism and fantasy while she simultaneously tries to make sense of the adult world she's maturing into. This complex is only further twisted by the fact that in Sarah's fantasy, her mother's new partner, Bowie, is the antagonist who is trying to seduce Sarah and force her into the adult world. I'm going to take time later to discuss Sarah's complicated dynamic with Jareth, but for now I just want to emphasize how Sarah's imagination paired with her inability to make sense of the adult world around her leads her to create a fantastical scenario she's constructed to attempt to sort out all of these confusing feelings. The labyrinth that she's trying to solve is merely a metaphorical construct representing the twists and turns that her own consciousness is caught up in. And it's the real world items in a room that she uses as characters and landscapes to represent the greater outside world of adulthood. Sarah is essentially still a child, playing make-believe and acting out against her parents, who even comment that they wish she'd grow up. When she derides Toby for allegedly stealing her teddy bear and makes the wish for the Goblin King to take Toby away, she's thrust into an imaginative world where she's faced with increasingly confusing and overwhelming challenges. But despite these challenges, she's steadfast in two things, trying to get her brother back and remaining positive, kind, and innocent. These two aspects are correlative and the heart of the journey. Toby, the baby, is a symbol of Sarah's own innocence. And despite the overwhelming adversity is trying to make her give up, she refuses to give in or give up. In doing so, she comes to realizations along the way. It's not fair. You say that so often. I wonder what your basis for comparison is. It's not fair! No, it isn't. But that's the way it is. Showing that she's growing up as a person, but in a positive way. When she's faced with puzzles, she uses logic to solve her problems. Okay, let's handle this thing logically. What exactly have you sworn? I have sworn with my lifeblood. No one shall pass this way without my permission. May we have your permission? Well, I... Uh, 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 mm. 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 <laughs> yes? Thank you, noble sir. My lady. And often employs empathy when other characters are quick to abandon and remains faithful to her principles. Sarah is effectively trying to navigate the confusing and often oppressive nature of the adult world, growing up in the process while fighting to retain her innocence in the face of often nefarious experiences. In my opinion, this is a true plot of the labyrinth. 
The adversity is a confusing adult world being thrust upon a child. The journey is trying to learn these rules while navigating through it, and the moral is that retaining your childhood innocence and simple sense of right and wrong in this adult world may be difficult, but will ultimately result in a richer adult life. Next, I want to take a look at some of the characters and challenges of the labyrinth, and try to explain how I think these are manifestations of real-life dilemmas that Sarah is trying to decipher and overcome. Initially, I painstakingly broke down virtually every single element of every single character interaction, design, and situation. So we're here making a documentary about Ketamine, actually. Do you know anything about it? <laughs> but I realized after that such an exhaustive analysis would not only be overkill, but also overreaching in some regards. Unnecessary when describing how little characters like the tile movers are obviously just funny ways to show a person gets misled or confused. <laughs> And overreach is like saying the giant robot, Humongous, is supposed to represent anything more than great challenge to overcome. Or that the bog of eternal stench is... Oh, it doesn't matter what it's like! It's a bog of eternal stench! Not everything in a show made for kids need to be explained as a metaphor, and some things are better left unsaid. All that aside, here are a few of the key interactions I wanted to take a look at. The first character that Sarah encounters in the labyrinth is Hoggle. Hoggle is an interesting character because he effectively represents someone who has been nearly defeated by life. He stands as a contrast to Sarah's youthful naivety. He represents a spirit that has lost his hope, optimism, and self-worth through his experience. Which way would you go? Me? I wouldn't go either way. If that's all the help you're going to be, you can just leave. You know your problem. You take too many things for granted. <laughs> take this labyrinth. Even if you get to the center, you'll never get out again. We can see evidence of this at many points. Not only is he shamelessly pissing in the open when she finds him, but he's killing fairies. Fairies are the quintessential symbol of fantasy and imagination. Are you in there, little bug? I'm not a bug. I'm a fairy. I do not believe in fairies. Every time someone says, I do not believe in fairies, somewhere there's a fairy that falls down dead. 57. <laughs> How could you? Yeah. So Hoggle killing them shows his active refusal of childishness. However, the fairy subsequently bites Sarah, giving her a first lesson about how not everything fantastical can be trusted outright. This is a simple yet effective way to show Hoggle's pessimism and Sarah's naivety. Hoggle fears Jareth, who bullies him into tricking Sarah into going back to the beginning of the labyrinth. You've got to understand my position. I'm a coward, and Jareth scares me. What kind of position is that? No position. That's my point. However, he also tries to trick Jareth, showing that he's opportunistically untrustworthy. The way he's willing to play both sides and can't be trusted is physically represented in his clothing, which is a literal symbol of being two-faced. <laughs> Hoggle tries to hustle where he can and makes a point to show that he's wiser than Sarah. Oh, don't sound so smart. You don't even know what a noodle it is. Do you? Yes. It's a place to put people to forget about them. But it's clear that he's conflating experience with wisdom. Hoggle does this because he's spiteful. He doesn't believe in hope. He's bullied and belittled in a world that doesn't respect him enough to even remember his name. Oh dear. Poor Hoghead. Hoggle. The hedge won't. Hogwart. Hoggle? Figgle. Hoggle? Yes. Thanks for nothing, Hogwart. Ow, oh, it's Hoggle! Like I mentioned, this is in contrast to the naivety of Sarah, but it's through Sarah's approach to the labyrinth that Hoggle experiences his own character development. Even when Sarah is getting tricked or ripped off, she pushes forward with positivity and doesn't let it stop her, even when it gets her down momentarily. He didn't tell you nothing. Well, well then, there go a couple of suckers. And despite Hoggle tricking her just the scene before, she calls him her friend. Why, why did you say that about my being your friend? Because you are. Friend. Huh. I like that. I ain't never been no one's friend before. Huh. Hoggle likes being called her friend, but almost immediately he gets frightened by an unfavorable situation and abandons her. Are you my friend or not? No, no, I'm not. Hoggle ain't no one's friend. He's 
looks after himself, like everyone. Showing just how quick he is to fall back into his role in life, even though he hates that role. Unlike Hoggle, Sarah's other new friends, Ludo and Sir Didymus, who remain encouraged by Sarah and steadfast in the endeavor, Hoggle continually wavers, showing just how affected he's been by his lot in life. Ludo and Didymus are more archetypal or flat characters. Ludo is a kind brute that will literally move mountains for his friends, and Sir Didymus is a courageous but overly confident character that is willing to go fight anyone, even if his reasoning is questionable. Hoggle continues to be swayed by Sarah's kindness, but for every two steps forward, his old ways and Jarrett's influences push him a step back. This results in him reluctantly feeding her a poisoned fruit, which he immediately regrets. Uncle, what have you done? Oh, damn you, Jarrett. And damn me, too. Hoggle thinks Sarah won't forgive him, again drawing light to his cynical and fatalistic propensities. But the kindness Sarah offered him gives him the courage to finally stand up for himself and save the group against their greatest threat. It's after the big save that he stubbornly exclaims, I'm not asking to be forgiven. I ain't ashamed of nothing I did. I'd like to take this chance to apologize to absolutely nobody! Showing that he won't take ownership for his failure and tries to push her away rather than try and take accountability and ask for forgiveness. I don't care what you think of me. I told you I was a coward, and I ain't interested in being friends. Sarah, rather than arguing his attempts at playing victim or pushing him back in return, says, I forgive you, Hoggle. You, you do? And I commend you. Rarely have I seen such courage. You are a valiant man, Sir Hoggle. <laughs> I am. No, don't friends. <laughs> this unexpected kindness and encouragement finally sways Hoggle, at which point he exclaims, Well, what are we waiting for? Oh, yeah. huh? Let's get that rat who calls himself Jerry. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Hoggle's cynicism was positively affected by Sarah's kindness and steadfastness, but that doesn't mean Sarah isn't being affected by her experience in the maze. As I posited before, the maze is a kind of mental construct that Sarah has imagined to help her make sense of the adult world that she's now being exposed to. In the literal world, she's trying to make sense of adult situations, adaptations, and urges. Perhaps most perplexing and troubling to her is her mother abandoning her family, and the confusion behind all this has led her to mentally transform the real-life actor played by Bowie into Jareth, the Goblin King. It's truly palpable just how sexually charged the character is. Henson specifically chose a rock star because he was very aware of the type of magnetism that he wished Jared to exude. Speaking in Le Grand Fantastique, a French magazine, Henson is quoted as saying, he cast Bowie because he embodied a certain maturity with his sexuality, his disturbing aspect, all sorts of things that characterize the adult world. And if his appearance and aura wasn't enough to sell a sexual presence, his overstuffed bulge definitely sealed the deal. Anybody familiar with the Labyrinth is very, very aware of Jarrah's bulge and the threatening yet gravitational power that it exudes. This wasn't just a natural package of Bowie. This was an intentional wardrobe design. He's completely alluring, completely uh, a character that draws people in and people are infatuated with. And what better to play the part than a rock star because that's what they are. In the way I built the Jareth character, I gave him other qualities. He's also a romantic hero. He's also contemporary with the leather jacket, has armor on it. This refers to 15th century knights. I gave him a swagger stick. It has a crystal ball. But if you look at it, it's a microphone. There's, the, there's a lot of subtleties going on in that. He is supposed to be um, a young girl's dream of a pop star. Um, we got in a lot of trouble, you know, about maybe how tight his pants were, but that was, that was deliberate. Which only further drives home some of the more disturbing elements of a movie wherein an adult man stalks, threatens, and at times tries to seduce a young girl. And to be honest, some of the allegations against Bowie that came out after this movie, many years later, only make the dynamic between him and Jennifer Connelly more problematic in real life. But without going into those real-world details, it's safe to say that Jared's sexual magnetism was a very real decision by Henson. This is all done with the attention of driving home just how confused Sarah is as she A, comes into womanhood and tries to make sense of the hormonal confusions therein, and B, tries to understand what would drive her mother to abandon her only a few years earlier. 
That is why at times he comes across as almost a father figure, whereas other times a threatening menace, and other times a seductive suitor. This is a point we'll come back to shortly, but I think now it's an appropriate time to mention one of the most infamous scenes in the movie, the ballroom scene. Kind of cool how the ball becomes the ballroom, eh? I like balls. After Sarah eats the apple that Jareth forced Hoggle to give her, she begins to show signs of inebriation and falls into a daze. In my opinion, this can either be taken literally as someone drugging her, or symbolically as Sarah's own mind succumbing to the fantasy of partaking in the adult world of lust and courting, as represented by a fancy ball. For the most part, Toby, Sarah, and Jareth are the only humans in the labyrinth, as they're actually humans outside of Sarah's imaginary maze. But the dance in the hall is the exception, as the humans here truly represent the adult world to Sarah, even if they are imagined. At first, the visuals are ornate and beautiful, as Sarah continues to be entranced by the spectacle of it all. Jareth plays the cat to her mouse, and Sarah finds the fun courting behavior amusing. Finally, they embrace, and she's overtaken by the moment, as Jareth holds her and stares deeply into her eyes like an enamored lover, as a peer. But quickly, the ominous nature of the setting dawns on her, as the people in the hall become more and more menacing and malicious, showing her just how out of place a young girl is in this setting. This is honestly the real-life equivalent of an older guy trying to impress an underage girl by taking her to a club. <laughs> Man, you are one pathetic loser. <laughs> he easily navigates a situation that he knows well, and his fluency in a situation that is novel and exciting impresses the girl. However, intuition and warnings might make someone slowly become aware of the very real dangers looming all around, and that's exactly what happens as Sarah becomes attuned to the situation. This is a scene in which innocence is truly being attacked by experience, preying on the childish optimism and naivety that should be protected, not exploited, not abused. Luckily, Sarah is able to come to her senses before she falls prey to the menacing intentions, and she pushes away from Jareth and shatters the illusion of this scene. Thank God. That was weird. What follows the ballroom is a scene that must have been very confusing and unsettling for a young viewer. Baby. <laughs> Sarah essentially wakes up in a junkyard with no memory of who she is or what her intentions were. To me, this is emblematic of a person beginning to lose their way in the world, essentially going down a path that strays from their truer self. The landscape is full of figures bent over with huge piles of junk upon their back, which they're adding to as they collect what they can amongst the piles of debris. One such figure is a somewhat manic woman who tries to dissuade Sarah from making sense of her state of amnesia. I was looking. And where were you going? Hmm? Don't remember. You can't look where you're going if you don't know where you're going. Sarah believes the woman and clutches her old teddy bear. And then the lady brings Sarah back to Sarah's real world room. At first she thinks it's all a dream. But then the lady enters the room and begins showing Sarah all the things she covers from her childhood. Little bunny rabbit, you like your little bunny rabbit, don't you? Yes, 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 there you go. Ooh, and there's Betsy Boo, you remember Betsy Boo, don't you? Yes, yes, yes. Mm. Remember? Hey, hey, remember Ghostbusters? Oh, I remember. Remember Slimey? Oh, Slimey, Slimey. As Sarah remains dazed and bewildered, trying to make sense of her memories, the woman begins piling on her old toys and trinkets, building a mound of items on Sarah's back, exclaiming, It's all here. Everything in the world you've ever cared about is all right here. Look. In my opinion, this whole sequence is representative of someone who lost their way, but more specifically, someone who is unable to cope with a particularly jarring experience. That ballroom scene was too much for Sarah, and that attack on her innocence traumatized her. And unfortunately, one prevalent symptom of real-world trauma is a stunt of maturity. People unable to cope with a traumatic event or a series of traumatic events can lose their ability to mature mentally from that point. And just like Sarah being back in a room, rather than continuing on her journey through the maze, people can become frozen in their past, unable to progress through their own journeys in life, simply trying to cherish some moments and items in life that represent a time before they were traumatized. A place where in looking back is safer than moving forward. In this sense, the people of the junkyard are lost souls. Not those lost souls. 
Republic, these are souls. One becomes disconnected from life. For a time, I was a lost soul myself. Really? Tetris. They are collecting everything from their past, but all of this is simply weight building upon their shoulders, hindering them from continuing down a healthy path in life. It's all junk. Huh? Eh, wh well, what about this? This is not junk. Eh? Yes, it is. Sarah fortunately comes to this realization and shatters his facade. Once she breaks free from the spell, her friends are waiting there with open arms. A warm and gentle reminder that those we love and who have loved us are waiting for us when we come back from the darkness. After this, the group of companions face a few more obstacles and then take on the full force of Jairus' army. As mentioned before, there's not much reason to try and overanalyze these set pieces. They're essentially just the functional climax of the second act and don't need to be deciphered past the point of general adversities to overcome in life. When they finally get to the palace, Sarah exclaims, I have to face him alone. But why? Yes. Because that's the way it's done. Well, if that is the way it is done, then that is the way you must do it. But should you need us... Uh, yes, should you need us... A call. In the following scene, she traverses through the M.C. Escher stair set, showing that she's in the deepest and most confusing part of her inner consciousness. This whole sequence is just masterfully shot, utilizing some very creative filming techniques. All right, let's take a moment to put on the Zoom and do uh, stay there. I think we'd want to be... We very carefully storyboarded this whole sequence and followed it closer than we ever did anywhere else in the film because there were sequences in here where we wanted David to do things which couldn't, you couldn't really do. Jarrah stalks her as she tries to save Toby, and in his singing, he again vacillates between anger, sympathy, contempt, and desire. However, this time Sarah isn't allowing herself to be affected by any of it, at which point Jareth laments, I can't live with you. At face value, this is definitely a disturbingly creepy line. Oh, I long to be, is it wrong to be inside you? But I want to posit that this is Jareth coming to the realization that he's not going to persuade Sarah to stay within his maze. And since the maze is all a construct of Sarah's imagination that he himself lives within, he'll cease to exist at all. This leads to a final confrontation, where Jareth is clearly desperate, pulling out any form of manipulation he possibly can, in a way that is very characteristic to abuser finally losing control over their victim. I have been generous up until now, but I can be cruel. Generous? What have you done that's generous? Everything. I have reordered time. I have turned the world upside down. And I have done it all for you. I am exhausted from living up to your expectations. I ask for so little. Just let me rule you. And you can have everything that you want. Just fear me. Love me. Do as I say, and I will be your slave. But in the most quintessential and effective way a victim can overcome their abuser, Sarah states, You have no power over me. You have no power over me. This ends this portion of the journey for Sarah, as Jarrah's world of illusion, deception, and manipulation is rendered powerless by her. Hardly any time has passed in the real world since Sarah made her initial wish to the Goblin King. As mentioned earlier, Sarah is in the liminal, awkward, and confusing point between two worlds, that of childhood innocence and that of adulthood experience, which is further emphasized by the 13-hour time frame that Jairus challenges her with at the beginning of the journey. Sarah makes her wish of the Goblin King at midnight, and as we know, the space between midnight and one exists functionally as a crossover between days, which parallels Sarah's own crossover from childhood to adulthood. However, in folklore, there is a space within this crossover where goblins and demons can travel through the realms of the real and the ethereal. When Sarah's parents return, it is shown that barely any time has passed, proving that this fantasy existed within that realm of a crossover. That is to say, very little time has passed literally, but figuratively, Sarah has gone through a great journey within this space, within her labyrinth. 
That's the name of the movie. That last part of the sentence, yeah, not the whole sentence. Sarah checks on her brother, relieved, and then starts putting away some of her toys and trinkets, as well as the photo of her mother and Bowie. This shows how she's ready to leave some of the parts of her childhood behind, and how she's coming to terms with the way her mother abandoned her, and the tumultuous effect that it had on her family and her psyche. This is a powerful gesture, but out of the corner of her eye, she sees Ludo, and then Didymus, who exclaims, And remember, fair maiden, should you need us? Yes, should you need us, for any reason at all. I need you, Huggle. Showing that even though she's maturing and ready to enter adulthood, she'll always cherish her innocence and her past core-defining memories. And then they all dance together. <laughs>